MMT's in good shape. Shuttle program is go to let you launch your landing. Okay. Today, America's last space shuttle makes its final flight. This is the last of the last of the last. We have one last chance to see her through the eyes of those who know her best. It's not going to be easy for everybody just to walk out of here. Six, five, four. It's an exclusive inside look at the end of an era. We have made it. A time for reflection. It's in the human spirit to explore, and the shuttle's allowed us to do that. It's an amazing feat of engineering. And a celebration of the craft that has shown our planet and our universe in ways barely imagined 30 years ago. Say, hey, we ought to do something like that again. Inspection team and close that crew have entered the pad. Today, a remarkable era of exploration comes to an end. After Atlantis takes to the air, there will be no more space shuttles. Someday, mankind may build a better craft for bringing humans and cargo back and forth to space, but that's a concern for another time. Today, NASA's job is to keep Atlantis and her crew safe in the final hours before the last launch. The countdown begins over a year in advance. Atlantis needs a complete overhaul Every inch must be inspected and repaired. 2,000 technicians check over 2 million parts and systems. They know what's at stake. One small flaw not spotted by the engineers will mean one giant catastrophe for the astronauts who will ride millions of pounds of explosive fuel into space. Ferguson, Hurley, Magnus, and Walheim will be the last crew to fly the shuttle. They follow in the footsteps of some of the bravest, most intrepid explorers to leave Earth. We really did uh, do some fantastic things with the vehicle. I was picked to go fly a, a mission where we were going to try to rescue a satellite for the first time and go out and, uh, and repair that while it was on orbit. NASA's fleet of five shuttles not only ferried astronauts and supplies to the space station, but launched experiments that would change our understanding of the cosmos. Well, we had started to do astronomy missions to, to Jupiter, to uh, Venus. Then we started doing the telescope stuff. Uh, Hubble was the first great observatory we put up. This is Hubble Telescope Control Green Belt. Okay, we have a goal for release, and we're going to be a minute late. Okay, Charlie. I don't know how many times have we flown to Hubble, four or five times, to service, repair, fix, replace, upgrade. Velcro strap on the left door, and from here. Flight PDRS, go ahead. The telescope's released. Okay, thank you. And what magnificent and wondrous pictures we have gotten from Hubble the birth of stars, the deaths of stars, the formation of galaxies. Fundamentally, the beginnings of the universe. The space shuttle has brought the final frontier closer. We were doing what the vehicle was designed to do. One badge goes there. Jerry Sheehan joined the shuttle team as a junior engineer in 1973. We're uh, going into uh, OPF Bay 1, Space Shuttle Atlantis. Now he's responsible for ensuring Atlantis is fit to fly. That's the front end of a Space Shuttle orbiter. It's about the size of a 737 airplane. It's a big airplane. It's very difficult to see because there's so many access platforms that we have around it so that we can 
inspect everything, assure everything's ready for flight. The space shuttle vehicle is three major parts. The backbone, the core of the shuttle is the external tank. The two solid rocket boosters, the white boosters on either side of the tank, and then the orbiter attached to the top. The space shuttle's magic is the magnitude of it. It's like taking a 737, tipping it on its side, strapping a half a million gallons of rocket fuel to it, and, and launching it into space. Chris Ferguson will be the last shuttle commander. He and his crew are all veteran astronauts. Well, welcome up, uh, welcome to the flight deck. Uh, it's set up a lot like a commercial airliner, uh, although it's anything but a regular airplane. Of course, you know, I don't know the last time somebody flew a delta wing glider that weighs 230,000 pounds, but, uh, but it does fly like a regular airplane. And of course, we have a control stick. We, we really don't fly it manually for very long, maybe for just a couple minutes. The shuttles are built for grand goals. To create a permanent human presence in space. To take a first step on the road to other planets. But like any exploration of the unknown, it's dangerous. Two out of five space shuttles have been lost in action, most recently in 2003. STS-107, the, uh, the mission that we lost Columbia on, uh, started out all right until a uh, large chunk of foam came off the external tank and uh, smacked into the leading edge of uh, the left-hand wing. And uh, the program decided that it really wasn't necessary to utilize spy cameras to see if we could see anything on the leading edge. So we continued the mission. I was standing out at the shuttle landing facility waiting for it to come home, and, uh, and we have a clock out there. And the clock ticks down to zero when the orbiter should be landing. And I'll never forget that that, that clock ticked down to zero, but Columbia wasn't there. And so Columbia was somewhere between orbit and the Kennedy Space Center, and we didn't know where. And I received a call from uh, one of my daughters who uh, works in Houston training astronauts how to fly the space shuttle. And she says, Daddy, we've lost contact. That was tough. It really was. There's heavy grief in our hearts, which will diminish with time, but it will never go away. And we will never forget. Hail Rick. Willie, KC, Mike, Laurel, Dave, and Alan. Hail Columbia. The entire shuttle program is put on hold until the loss of the Columbia is fully investigated. As today's countdown continues, the crew of Atlantis, like every crew before them, knows the risks. But there'd be no shortage of volunteers to take their place on the shuttle's last launch into space. With the launch still months away, Atlantis's engineering team is installing one of many cameras. Right now, you've got about half an inch. All right, stop. These will help the crew to check the orbiter for any damage before it returns from space. The Columbia tragedy is at the forefront of everyone's minds. Back in 2003, just hours after the loss of Columbia, NASA launches an investigation. I assembled my team that, that would go out there that night to set up a recovery. That was a surreal day. An orbiter weighs about 230,000 pounds. We got back 83,000 pounds. The rest of it um, is just gone. It, it either completely vaporized during re-entry or is at the bottom of a lake. So we got back about a third of Columbia, laid it out in the shape of the orbiter, 
We are now in front of our uh, physical 3D reconstruction of the left hand leading edge of Columbia's uh, wing. The failure first occurred at the bottom of number eight, which is right here. We did test firing pieces of foam at the orbiter wing, and uh, uh, I frankly was shocked. I was shocked that it knocked a hole in. I thought for sure it would crack it, but I, I would have lost a million dollar bet with your money. It was absolutely amazing. There was no doubt at what happened at that point, no doubt at all. The hole in Columbia's wing allows heat to penetrate the craft during re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. It rips the vehicle apart. The space shuttle may be the most incredible flying machine ever built, but the suspicion that it is fatally flawed takes hold. We believe that another vehicle, either a complement or a replacement, is a very, very high priority. Since Columbia, there have been 19 successful missions, and now the countdown is on for the final launch of the very last shuttle. For the four-person crew, it's the last chance to practice what they've trained to be, astronauts. This is the mid-deck of the shuttle. So this is sort of our, our house. We sleep down here, we eat down here, we store things down here. Well, you can see here we have all the uh, comforts of home, so to speak. Uh, privacy curtain, places to put your towels. You do all your hygiene here. Remember, in space, we don't take showers. We just kind of do sponge baths, wipe off. Uh, and I'll leave the rest to your imagination. <laughs> While the astronauts prepare for their part of the mission, thousands of other specialists are at work around the country. In Louisiana, they are building the shuttle's fuel tank. This is the largest single component of the space shuttle. Fuel tank inspector Kirk Drum has worked here for 16 years. This will be the last tank to go into space. People just think it's a big orange tank. When I first came here, I thought of it as a giant thermos bottle. But uh, it's a lot more than that. This is actually, um, they, they hate to say it, but it's, it's a giant bomb. The front part is the liquid oxygen tank. This part right here is the hydrogen tank liquid hydrogen, and the two are combined inside the shuttle to create the explosion which then lifts the thing into space. During launch, 700 tons of liquid fuel will catch fire, emptying this tank in less than eight and a half minutes. Right now we're weighing it. We're doing the last readings. So this is the last of the last of the last, because as of the end of this month, the system shuts down. We don't have any more to do. We all go across the street, we get laid off, and that's it. I know that a lot of time and effort was put into putting this together. And um, of course, you know, I'm gonna be able to sleep in late now, but it's, I'm gonna miss it, you know, because it, it's been a big part of my life. and all your work. Here's to you. All right, one more and one, two. For its journey to Cape Canaveral, they load the fuel tank into a specially protected barge. The slightest scrape now could jeopardize the launch. The man in charge is Joe Chapman, who started working for NASA in 1985. You know, this is this is the end for a lot of people. A lot of a lot of hard work. A lot of people are teary eyes. It's the end of their career. It's hard. Joe's delivered over 40 of these behemoths. As you can see, it's a pretty tight fit. Um, the barge was specifically constructed to just protect the single external tank. These guys put it right between the yellow lines. Everything is good, and then uh, they'll secure it in place. So no matter how the barge works, the transporter will be intrinsic with the hull. 
Let's let's put it right here. After that's secured, we'll verify everything, and then we'll go ahead and sign for responsibility of the tank. Since, since I had to stay in because I was. Thank you very much. All right, Appreciate thank it. you. Good luck with everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. The fuel tank sets off on its last voyage across the Gulf of Mexico. It takes six days to round the Florida Peninsula and reach the Kennedy Space Center. The fuel tank will supply fuel to three engines inside the orbiter. These are the last engines to be installed for the last flight. It's the last time that we get to do the things that we do well. I mean, everything else after this is just going to be like putting your tools away. Mike Cosgrove has been with the shuttle engines team for 25 years. He knows every detail of this sophisticated system. The shuttle engine is the most complex uh, component on the entire shuttle system. It has the highest number of at-risk components. These engines must accelerate Atlantis to a speed of 17,000 miles per hour to reach orbit. Yes, sir. everything's ready for you, brother. We'll do it. Get a quick comp check. When the propellants combine and, and are ignited in the main combustion chamber and then are flowing out the nozzle, the gas is continuously expanding. The shape of the, of the nozzle controls that expansion and funnels it in one direction. Well, that's what creates our thrust, around 500,000 pounds of thrust. This engine has to work right. We have to install it correctly. The success of the mission, ultimately the lives of the astronauts are at risk here if it's not done correctly. The countdown to launch continues. Workers are now inspecting over 24,000 tiles that will protect Space Shuttle Atlantis from the tremendous heat of friction when she re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. Every shuttle mission is risky, but this one comes with the added pressure of being the final one. The tiles have caused trouble since the very beginning when pilot Bob Crippen flew the first space shuttle mission in 1981. We knew there was risk, uh, but we thought we were prepared uh, to be able to handle it. When you get inside of uh, six seconds prior to liftoff, that's when uh, the main engines are lit off. So uh, the engines are up and running, and I'm checking them on my instruments. Uh, so uh, that part's good. And we do that six seconds to make sure that the engines are up and running properly. And the vehicle does swing because of the thrust from the engines. And when it comes back vertical is when it's time to ignite the solids. And then bang, you get this big kick in the pants. When I got the doors open, uh, I looked back at the rear end of the vehicle, and uh, there was obviously some tiles missing. There weren't that many, I don't know, maybe a couple dozen. I think the ground was pretty concerned at that particular point as to whether we'd lost some tiles off the, uh, off the base of the vehicle, but uh, there's no way of telling that. There isn't anything you can do about it, so don't worry about it. <laughs> when traveling at five miles per second during re-entry, the exposed surfaces of a shuttle can reach temperatures hot enough to melt steel. Hello, Houston. Uh, Columbia's here. Hello, Columbia. Houston's here. How do you read? Glenn and we're doing uh, Mach 10.3 at our heart. And we couldn't agree more, John. Your state vector's good. 190 knots. One speed brakes are tracking. Down. There's relief all round when the first shuttle lands safely. But 134 missions later, the danger posed by loose or faulty insulation still haunts the program. 
Every inch of Atlantis's heat shield is checked and checked again before her final launch. One chink in the armor can mean disaster. The whole external part of the shuttle is covered with some type of thermal protection. During re-entry, we're seeing temperatures of 2,600 degrees. Here's our, our RCC nose comb, uh, one of the hotter spots on the orbiter. This is the fib blanket material. It's a quartz material. This is the leading edge in the wing. Uh, Mike, if you could pull off number six, that's a reinforced carbon carbon. Very expensive, high temperatures, very, very durable. All of our systems, hydraulics, fuels, computers, we all have backup systems. With the thermal protections, it's one time. If we lost one, we have a burn through, it could be a very bad day. With launch day now just three months away, they are ready to assemble Atlantis's solid rocket boosters. Like giant fireworks, these rockets are packed with an explosive propellant that ignites at launch to thrust the shuttle off the pad. The rockets are built in Utah and transported in sections to Kennedy's Vehicle Assembly Building, known by insiders as the VAB. All right, we got a group, the crane crew, that's what we call them. They actually are the muscle of, of, of the VAB. They lift the big boosters into this high bay. Rodney Wilson has been a solid rocket booster technician for 23 years. He knows each section must be handled with extreme caution. The inside of this case, you have solid propellant. You gotta be careful. Once you light the igniters, they send a big spark through the center of the hole. And once you light, there's no way of turning it off. It's on. <laughs> and right here is where you see our hold down post. This is one of the corners where it actually sit and rests. That's what holds this whole entire stack up all the way up. The weight of the external tank, the shuttle, and this booster itself. It's a strong boat. <laughs> During the launch time, countdown, they actually send a signal and it explodes the boat and split it in half. And they all go out at the same time. Solid rocket boosters help lift the four and a half million pound shuttle off the pad. Two minutes later, the rockets are jettisoned. If it's a clear day, you'll see the orbiter and the external tank continue, and then you'll see both SRBs um, separate, tumble, and then fall right into the, to the ocean. During each launch, Joe Chaput's team waits 140 miles offshore to retrieve the boosters for reuse. The biggest reason for us there at that point is to make sure that there are no vessels in the immediate area of the splashdown point. But when you explain to any passing vessel that there's a 80-ton rocket with explosives coming down in their immediate vicinity, generally they get their attention and they'll, they'll change course and be very uh, amiable about it. See him? Right next to each other, right here. Right there, yeah. And as both SRBs re enter, there's a double sonic boom. The first time you hear it, it's pretty impressive. You're not going to sleep through it. Got it. All right. When the rockets land, they're vertical. And they trap air. It's similar if you take uh, in your bathtub, you take a, a glass jug that's empty and you turn it upside down and put it in the water, you trap air in it. That's how the boosters float. You can't tow them vertically. 
We tried that once and realized that was impossible to do that. We have to get the rockets into horizontal. Okay, PJ, we're on course for uh, the SRV. We'll and drop my job off. is to direct in that whole thing, and I kind of have a bird's eye view of the bridge level down. We have to uh, deploy divers, and then we pump air in, and the water comes out, and it actually brings it up to the surface, and then we connect a, a tow and, and bring it home. One day in 1986, the boosters take off, but do not come back. It seemed like after it occurred, it just lingered in the sky forever. While the countdown continues at Cape Canaveral, the Marine Operations Team delivers two rocket boosters recovered from the Atlantic. They've perfected this procedure over 30 years and 134 successful launches. But on a cold winter day in 1986, the booster failed. I've been on the ocean since I was five or six years old, and uh, I've been through some bad weather, you know, uh, that the cold front that preceded the Challenger launch, we had winds of uh, 65 knots for two days out there. It got so bad that we couldn't even turn the ships. We had to just stick bound to the waves. So uh, the 28th of January, I think, in the morning, they launch. Although it was a terribly cold day, I don't particularly remember that. I was standing outside with a bunch of coworkers and uh, watch the countdown and the, the uh, engine start, lift off. Lift off of the 25th Space Shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower. Go for throttle up. And boom. One minute, 15 seconds, velocity 2,900 feet per second. I saw what happened and I thought, oh, well, we'll just, the orbit will just pull out of that and fly back on a return launch site aboard. And that's not what happened. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have no downlink. You could see the pieces fall down, you know, through the atmosphere and watch the pieces hit the hit the ocean surface from the long range cameras here on the site. Scientists investigating the Challenger disaster analyze every available scrap of evidence including film from nearly 200 cameras. We had this beautiful machine that would work so well. What the heck went wrong? The cause of the accident is traced to a joint failure in the right rocket booster, a design flaw resulting in seven deaths. It's like losing some of your family. Uh, I think uh, everybody out here would tell you that. And that's why, uh, that's why every launch now is precious. Every launch is uh, double finger cross, double prayers, double whatever you need to do, get that bird up in the air and keep it safe, you know? It's easy to appreciate why the shuttle workforce takes their jobs so seriously. The astronauts' lives are in their hands. The environment you're going into is so hostile that if the vehicle isn't perfect, you're not going to come home. The charts, checklists, and spreadsheets are as vital as the bolts and insulation. Once the stack of work paper gets to orbital altitude, your vehicle's ready to fly. There's now just 11 weeks before Atlantis lifts off. Before the orbiter is ready for rollout, engineers must close the spacecraft's cargo bay doors. They are extremely fragile. 
If they twist or jam, the astronauts may not be able to open the doors in space, putting the entire mission in jeopardy. The doors are real life. The doors weren't designed to be open in our regular gravity. You can't take the doors and open them up with a crane. They're just too thin. The doors are very thin. So the way we actually open the doors, they use counterweights and a system of pulleys and blocks that allow us to float the doors closed. Yeah, very gentle, very smooth. Atlantis's cargo bay is the size of a bus. It will soon be packed full. Well, since we're the last shuttle, we're going to be the heaviest cargo module we've ever flown because they're going to cram everything they can. This is their last chance to get all the heavy stuff up there. This will be the shuttle's last delivery to the space station. On board will be 25,000 pounds of food, water, and spare parts. That's how it's going to go in. Yeah. It will be years before anything big or heavy can be carried there again. It was the shuttle that carried most of the International Space Station's 14 modules into orbit. This is the largest man-made object in the sky. It's permanently manned by crews drawn from all over the world. For launch director Mike Lineback, this is the shuttle's greatest achievement. Space Station is, is, is the, it's the max. I mean, it, it's terrific. I mean, I remember when it was first proposed, the volume of the thing and, and the weight. Um, a lot of people doubted we could pull it off. And to see it work on orbit, is, it's just, it's, it's almost, it's, it's almost surreal. The thing that comes to mind always is, is Star Trek, to me. You look at the crews and, and the languages and the cultures and the food that they eat, and, and uh, it is truly an international space station. It, it's wonderful to see. Now the French are flying to the station with their vehicle, the Japanese are flying to the station with their vehicle, of course the Russians are flying to the station with their vehicle, and we're going to do it one more time. Atlantis is now ready to be attached to her boosters and fuel tank so she can begin her final journey to the launch pad. After a year of work, Atlantis is leaving the orbiter processing facility for the final stage of assembling the space shuttle. It's an emotional moment for everyone. It's Atlantis. It's my vehicle. <laughs> This, this is our payoff. But when you get to come out and you, and you to see it out in the open like this, this is your reward. This is, this is what it's all about. It, it tends to look a little bit rough around some of the edges. Uh, that's just uh, normal fair wear and tear on a reusable spacecraft. It's, uh, it still looks beautiful to me. This one just seemed to be so significant. We didn't, we didn't make this, uh, you know, and have an opportunity to, you know, rub elbows and shake hands with some of the folks who've been working on this vehicle for their entire lives. I mean, we owe it to them. Oh, hold one second. Let me just smile real quick. Here. Thank you, guys. You getting used to it? Sort of. Just smile. I'd rather do a four-hour uh, acid simulation than smile for two hours. It's easier. <laughs> all these people that you see out here, all these people work at the center. They all take part in processing of this orbit. They may not be turning a screw, they may not be doing a test, they may not be an engineer, but they are as important as that engineer and all those people turning the screws. They process the paper that gets us there, that allows us to launch, that meets all the requirements. And that's what they're here for. They're here to see the last one that we're going to do. And uh, that's important to everybody. It's a great feeling. It's something that will never be replaced. This is the moment when the orbiter will be attached to its fuel tanks and boosters, turning it into the most powerful space rocket on Earth. In her final salute, 
Atlantis rises a hundred feet into the air. It's a dramatic sight they'll never forget. The shuttle is up in the uh, vertical position, and as you can see, this is the 175-ton uh, crane, which is attached on the aft end of the orbiter, which is getting ready to be uh, disconnected from the shuttle itself. So just slightly. They just pulled the pins and dis disconnected from the orbiter, so one crane is just holding the load at this time. The man on the floor, he's got his hands on the tail fin of the uh, shuttle just to stabilize it. That's amazing. It doesn't take much to make the shuttle move around. Let's go ahead and start moving to the north. You can increase just slightly, Charlie. Number three, moving north. Roger. So up she goes. The billion dollar spacecraft hangs from a single crane. Like a toy spaceship, they gently nudge her into position. The uh, orbiter is lowered down through about 12 different levels of platforms with a tolerance of about anywhere from four to six inches of clearance. So there's a little nerves every once in a while. It's a few dollars hanging on to the Never did. Balancing on its gigantic mobile launch platform, the shuttle is ready to roll. This is the last time a space shuttle will make the three-mile trip to the launch pad. I was here for the very first shuttle rollout and everyone since. It's so much like watching your kid go off to college. They're on their own, finally, and they're, they're on their way to meet their destiny. And uh, you hope you've done everything that you needed to do. But there's always that little bit of doubt in your mind. That's exactly the way I felt when I saw the kids drive down the street for the last time. Tomorrow is the moment of truth, launch day for Atlantis. America's shuttle program is ready for its final flight. For Commander Chris Ferguson and his crew, the training is over. This is it. In just four hours, they will blast into space on board Atlantis. When the clock hits zero, all the responsibility comes down to one man, launch director Mike Lineback. Mike's team meticulously monitors each system as it comes online. My job is to meet all of our launch commit criteria, and that's 22,000 parameters that have to be right to launch the shuttle. Mike stands above it all. His senses finely tuned to the slightest anomaly. If he sees anything, he calls off the launch. We're monitoring uh, data off of the vehicle. It gets uh, uh, tense. There's time for considering the historical significance of what you're doing, but it's not during a countdown. You can't computerize everything, and you, and you need that final gut check at the end to, to say, yes, we're ready to commit these lives and this vehicle to flight today. Those whose lives have been shaped by the space shuttle come to pay homage. To see Atlantis take to the sky one last time. You get a chance to see the astronauts. Last group. I'm proud of those folks, though. I really am. I can only imagine what the astronauts are going through after waiting for so long. It must be awesome to be sitting on there. With God's help, it just get on up. This is the entity conducting the launch status check. 
and go for launch. A pause in the countdown enables each of the support teams to give its go for launch. TTC, TTC is go. LPS. This final flight is the culmination of 30 years of NASA's shuttle program. This will be the last time NASA launches astronauts into space for many years to come. Atlantis launch director, on behalf of the greatest team in the world, uh, good luck to you and your crew on the final flight of this true American icon. Hey, thanks to you and your team, Mike. The shuttle's always going to be a reflection of what a great nation can do when it dares to be bold. We're not ending the journey today, Mike. We're completing a chapter of a journey that will never end. You and the thousands of men and women who gave their hearts, souls, and their lives for the cause of exploration have rewritten history. Let's light this fire one more time, Mike, and witness this great nation at its best. The crew of Atlantis is ready for launch. Here we go. Come on, baby. <laughs> go for main engine start. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. All three engines up and burning. 2, 1, 0, and lift off. incredible to be part of this program and uh, see the last one kind of hits you deep inside. There'll be something else along the way and uh, it'll be better but it's going to be hard to surpass something like this. Sitting on the ground zero miles an hour uh, within eight minutes it's going five miles a second. The, uh, the space shuttle is an incredible machine. It's not going to be easy for everybody just to walk out of here. They're going to take the memories with them and, uh, for a long, long time. We put seven people and the space station in space. Well, I've taken my granddaughter outside and said, Papa put that up there. The shuttle is not about hardware and propellants. It's really about people. Uh, people make it happen. It's in the human spirit to explore and, and to go that next step, go that extra mile, go to the next destination. The shuttle's allowed us to do that. We will continue to test our ingenuity, pushing the boundaries of space travel. But the shuttle program will always have its rightful place in history.